Good morning. Today, as I was, or not today, um, one of the uh, one of the problems with making slides for a for a sermon is that you become a slave to the slide system. And uh, as I I thought about it later on in the week after I'd already finished everything um, or most everything, I was thinking, you know, did I really choose a good title? You know. We've been talking about soundness, right? And soundness means health. Uh, we've been talking about that in relation to the church and in relation to what does soundness in theology look like lived out in a life. Um, so last week I said healthy old men, and this week I thought, well, I could just switch it out and say healthy old women. And I thought, well, that's probably not wise. Um, <laughs> It's not a good way to get somebody's attention. Um, so I thought, well, healthy women for a healthy church. And then that first song today about the beauty of the Lord, and it reminded me of some of the things that I had planned to talk about today with regard to women. And I thought, oh, that would have been a nice one too. Beautiful women in a healthy church. And we'll talk about those things in a few minutes. Um, but I, I want to remind you that beauty, when we talk about the beauty of the Lord, we're talking about the beauty of his glory. We're talking about the beauty of who he is. We're not talking about an external beauty. And women, I just want you to know right now, I'm going to talk about it later, but that is the kind of beauty that Christ calls you to have. External beauty is there, but external beauty will not last. The only things that will last will be the things that are done in obedience and submission to the Lord. A, a beautiful woman is one who loves Christ and seeks to be obedient to him. That is a beautiful woman. Um, so we'll, we'll be dealing with some of these things, but I just wanted to make that clear from the beginning and when I... When I saw that first song, I said, yeah, that's the opportunity. Because beauty is it's not external. Beauty to the Lord is not a matter of what the mirror tells you. Beauty is, is a gentle and a quiet and an obedient spirit to the Lord reflected in godly behavior. That's beauty. So today, as we start thinking about uh, the older and the younger women in the church what it looks like for a woman to be a healthy, as in a sound uh, woman in the faith. I want to remind us that Paul's desire for the church, um, really God's desire for the church, was that the, the church at Crete um, would increase in faith, in knowledge, specifically knowledge of the word, knowledge of the Lord, knowledge about their own salvation, and godliness, which is godly living, uh, Repeated throughout the letter to Titus, we see that we were, we we're supposed to do good works. We're supposed to be a pe people zealous to do good works. We're created for gr a good works, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, the Lord wants to see good works come out of our lives, and he transformed us by the gospel so that good works would result. Um, so that's, you know, that's another way of talking about godliness. Uh, another way of talking about godliness is reflecting the glory, the beauty of the Lord. Right? As, in as much as we reflect uh, God and all of his wonderful attributes, we reflect the beauty of the Lord. Um, but something is really important here as we, as we are in the middle of this book of Titus and we're looking at um, godly qualities of the people uh, that, are, uh, that are in the church and he breaks it down by, by age and by gender uh, even toward the end, referring to slaves and how they should live out their, their lives as, as followers of Jesus, um, we can be tempted to get mixed up. We can, be get, we can be tempted to not read the rest of the letter or to read this in absence of the gospel. And that's always, always an error. There is an order that we need to follow when we think of obedience to God. There is no amount of obedience... There is no thorough list that you could check off as far as do's and don'ts and character qualities that would ever make you acceptable in God's sight. You can't do anything. 
You can't make yourself anything in order to be acceptable to God. You can't. And we're going to talk about things that we ought to do because of what God has done. But if, if you hear me speaking today and you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm acceptable to God. I don't meet, m- match uh, that, that list. Well, no, you don't match that list. Paul would never have wrote, uh, written to the, the church at uh, Crete if all the women were already matching that list. It would have been pointless. Paul writes correctively. Right? So if you don't meet these quali- qualifications or if you don't meet these guidelines, welcome to humanity. But this is the thing you're supposed to press on toward. This is a gauge to look at your life and say, how can I grow? It's not, am I good enough for God? None of us are. In and of ourselves, none of us are acceptable to God. God, knowing that, sent his son, born of a virgin, who lived a sinless life. God himself took on a human nature, and he lived the perfect life that none of us have lived. Not one. And he died on the cross. He died the death of a criminal, of a rebel, of a runaway slave. We were the runaway slaves. Running away from the God who created us, who gave us life, who created us for his glory. And he died for us. He was insulted. He bled. He was spit upon. He suffered, bearing the weight of all our guilt. And he died on the cross. And when he died on the cross, he said, paid in full. He nailed it to the cross. All of the weight of all our sin for anybody who will come in faith and say, you know what? You're right. I'm a sinner. I deserve death and hell. But I believe that Jesus died in my place and I'm trusting in him alone for my salvation. That is what unites you. That faith that you have not just believed intellectually that Jesus died on the cross for sinners, but you've trusted in the fact that Jesus died for you and that he rose again for your justification, showing who he is. That's how you're right with God, through what God has done through Jesus Christ, not through what you can do yourself. But if you are a follower of Christ, you have a new way to live. Because the gospel is transformative. The gospel takes a sinful rebel and turns him into a submissive son. Or a sinful rebel who hates God and turns her into a loving, obedient, submissive daughter. The gospel does that. So Paul tells us, and Peter writes the same types of direction Uh, And we're going to, James writes the same kind of direction. We see the same kind of correction uh, in the gospel accounts uh, all throughout the New Testament. This is how you should live if you've been transformed by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. So that's the way we're going to be looking at this this today. I'm going to remind you where we are in the letter. Um, in the, in the first part, in the introduction, we see God's purposes for Paul and the church reflected in Paul's writing to Titus. He says, the God who cannot lie, this is how he wants you to live. He wants you to be growing in godliness, growing in knowledge, growing in faith. And this is how it's going to happen. First of all, he says, you need to have uh, Christ-like leaders of the church, godly elders, who are the same men wherever they go, at home, at work, and in the church building, They're the same men. In all of their relationships, they try to live out the gospel. They're men of high character and men who who, who guard the teachings of 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 the Bible. That is the New Testament, right? The New Testament, when we talk about the doctrine, when we see sound doctrine or the sound doctrine here in the New Testament, specifically in Titus, other places as well, we're talking about a body of teaching. We're talking about identifiable body of teaching that comes to us in the New Testament. This was the faith that Jesus Christ preached, that he passed on to his disciples, to the apostles, that they wrote down that we have in the New Testament. They're attested to us by the miracles and by the witnesses and by the life and the death and the resurrection of Christ. That's what this is. 
It's not something you know, peculiar and strange that you have to go to somebody to identify and write you out a list of what is the sound doctrine. It's the New Testament. He said this is important because you have to defend the church from false teachers and the wicked world. False teachers bring the wickedness of the world into the church and corrupt the gospel. Either, usually in one of two directions, either by saying, yes, God's grace is so great, you can just live the rest of your life any way you want to. And they take God's grace and they pervert it and they make it a license for sin. Or on the other side, people say, yes, God's grace is great. Now, if you keep it up and if you manage to do all the do's and don't do all the don'ts, then you'll be acceptable to God. And you're like, wait a minute, I thought I was acceptable to God through Jesus. You are. Right? Both of those are perversions of the truth. And they're very commonly the theme of false teachers. We have to defend the church against that. Then um, the big purpose of uh, the big body of, of two, chapter 2, 1 through 10 is in contradiction to the false teachers. The false teachers claimed to know God. They professed to know God. But by their living, they denied God. You don't have to just deny God by saying you don't believe in God. You can say, you can deny God by saying I believe in God and yet here's my life and I can live it any way I want. Well, you're just den you're denying the gospel, you're denying God when you do that. So it, so it calls for living out. Uh, and then last week we looked at godly men, and now we're going to look at godly women. So I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to look through. We're going to look hopefully briefly through these qualities. There's going to be some that we're going to pay a little more attention to because I think they're not that they're any more valuable or any more critical, but I think they're more, um, more helpful for us to see the distinction today and probably a little bit more appropriate to our living today. So let's have a word of prayer. Let's ask God to be working in our hearts, to be helping us to understand his word, but not just understand academically, understand spiritually, be convicted where we're going wrong, be encouraged to act where we are being indecisive and inactive, sinning by omission rather than commission, right? sinning by leaving something out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word shines the light of truth into every corner of our hearts. God, thank you for the fact that you still convict us. You don't just save us and then leave the obedience up to us. You save us. You give us your Holy Spirit. You convict us through a number of ways. Through loving brothers and sisters, through sermons, through books that we might read, through uh, Christian songs we might listen to, through all so our friends, through all sorts of ways you convict us and you, you grow us. But they're all associated with the truth of your word. So God, lay bare our hearts before you this morning. Who can discern his own errors? We need you, please, to show us where we need to grow. We thank you that you have made us your children through Jesus Christ. And we ask you to raise us, even if it means discipline. Raise us to be more like Jesus. Help us to live for your glory. Help us to live in such a way that adorns the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to live in such a way that the world really does see us, whether they like it or not, as the pillar and the foundation of the truth of godliness. That we would preach the gospel by everything we say and do. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go ahead and get into the text. We are in uh, Titus chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 2. Paul says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior. Let's pause this there for a second. Um, likewise, it just means in the same way as. Uh, so the way that Paul was describing how older men ought to live and behave is reverence, right? So, so when we see reverent uh, in behavior, I think there's two things that we need to consider with reverence. Um, one is the attitude of the fear of the Lord. 
When we talk about the fear of the Lord, we're not talking about, you know, like when you're a kid and you're afraid of whatever's in your closet, or rather not in your closet, right? You're scared. Not afraid of the Lord like some kind of boogeyman. Afraid of the Lord or fear of the Lord in, in a reverential way that is recognizing his power and his greatness and, our, and his holiness and our corresponding sinfulness, recognizing that power. Something way greater than standing on a beach and seeing a gigantic wave coming towards you. Something bigger than having a thunderhead roll in when you're out on the water. Something way bigger than that kind of fear. But it is a sort of a fear, right? You're recognizing, you're acknowledging how great God is and how small you are in comparison. But there's a second thing that I think reverence implies and it helps us understand. Reverence in behavior is holiness. Reverent behavior is a holy behavior. Now, behavior refers to the whole lifestyle. And so when he says, you know, older women, you need to be reverent in behavior, he's calling you to something similar that he's calling the men to, the male leadership of the church. You need to be the same women wherever you are. You need to be practicing the presence of the Lord wherever you are. When you look in the Old Testament, you see the kind of reverence that was demanded. Absolute obedience, a bunch of ritual washing to remind you of your unholiness and your need for holiness. A prescribed list that says, hey, God is not someone to be trifled with or to be taken lightly. He is the only holy one. He is the all-powerful one. You exist. Your molecules hold together because he says so. He's not someone to be treated with lightly. So be reverent in all that you do. Remember when, when Moses met the Lord? It seems in the, in, the, in the text for the first time. And there's the burning bush. And the Lord speaks to him from the burning bush. And he says, take off your shoes from your feet. Don't come any closer. You're on holy ground. Moses falls to his face, hides his face. He's terrified. Practice. Older women. All of us, right? Older women, he says. Practice the presence of the Lord all the time in every bit of your behavior. Secondly, he says, not slanderers. Now, this is a lovely word. It is used around 40 times in the New Testament. I think 35, if I counted correctly. 35 times, it's used in the masculine singular with a definite article. That's the, right? And do you know what it's translated as? The devil. This is the feminine plural, slanderers. He says, the, the devil. The word is diablo. I'm not probably not pronouncing that right. In Spanish, it's diablo. Do you know this word, I think? Uh, if you ever were into cars. Um, anyway, diablo, devil. But what it really means is somebody who accuses, somebody who points at and points out the things in other people's lives that are wrong. Now, that's not godly rebuke. Godly rebuke is prayerful, careful, self-examining, and private. Slander is like trying to rebuke somebody by way of somebody else. I'm not going to use physical examples because then you guys will wonder, like, wait, is there something we need to know? Slander is trying to destroy someone else in the mind of another brother or sister. I got a beef with so-and-so, so so I'm going to go to somebody else to let them know that beef. And I want that other person to, to despise this person that I'm angry at just as much as I despise them. Brothers and sisters, that is what the devil does. 
If you need any evidence, Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to read a few verses for us. When he says the devil, that's the same word, masculine and singular, from uh, this word slanderer. The word accuser that he says is another word, but it's a synonym. He says this. War broke out in heaven. I'm going to start in verse 7. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, the slanderer, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. Notice who's being accused. It's our brothers and sisters. It's brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's people who've been redeemed by the Messiah. And the devil, he says, accuses them night and day before the throne of God. When you slander another brother or sister in Christ, when you're seeking to destroy a brother or sister in Christ, you are acting like your father, the devil. Check out John chapter 8. I'm not making it up. Check out 1 John chapter 3. It is clear who the sons of God are as opposed to the sons of the devil because the sons of the devil go on and continue in their sin. Not that they stumble in their sin and they're grieved over their sin and they're repenting and they're trying. No, they go on and continue in their sin. Slander is a very serious thing. All sin is serious. But I want you to understand, when you slander, it, I don't think it's a coincidence that these words are the same. You are following the devil. You are trying to destroy your brother and sister. And that is what the devil is doing all the time. But I want you to listen to this from Revelation chapter 12 as well. They, that is, those brothers and sisters, even the ones who are being accused, even the ones who might be slandered, they triumphed over him, over the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. That they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. When the devil slanders a brother or sister before God, his word means nothing because the blood of the lamb testifies on your behalf. When you slander a brother or sister, your word will ultimately come to nothing for that brother or sister. It will not hurt them in one bit, not in the kingdom, because the blood of the lamb testifies on their behalf. But when you slander a brother or sister, you may be on a path that leads you right out of the church. Because if you continue on in that sin, then you will show yourself not to be of Christ and his kingdom. All sin is like that, that if you continue on in it, you will show who you really are. It's always one step towards repentance. And as long as there's breath in your body, it's not too late. If you find yourself in a ha habitual sin, turn around, repent, confess. Slaves to too much wine. We talked about this in the, uh, in the first section. We talked about um, uh, elders uh, and their sobriety, their need for sobriety. Uh, biblically speaking, uh, Although alcohol is not completely forbidden, intoxication is. Because being drunk is going to put you in a situation where you're not acting in accordance with the Word of God. You're not listening to the Word of God. You're not listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Your mind is confused and inebriated, and you are more likely to sin.
The Bible teaches us this. Slaves to much wine. I remember reading an article uh, once about um, retirement in Europe. And it said retirement isn't really as big of a thing in Europe. People think of it more as like half days. So whatever your job, you might, you might go home at noon. And it described this. This was years ago. I don't think it was even a concern at the time. But it described this state where people were looking forward to the time when they could work till noon and then drink the rest of the day. The truth is, though, sometimes when people reach retirement age, they think, okay, I'm just supposed to kick back now, kick back and do nothing. I'm going to kick back. I'm going to watch my shows. I'm going to enjoy my life. Maybe instead of a glass at lunch, I'll have three or four. Uh, I'm going to live my life now for myself. And I think that's what Paul is pointing to, where... Now, perhaps there were specific people he had in mind, or perhaps he's just talking generally, knowing the, the weaknesses of mankind. But he says, don't be slaves to much wine. Don't give yourself up to that kind of excess. He says they are to teach what is good. Really, like the literal language is teachers of what is good, and it's all one word. It can be kind of confusing. I, I love it, though. But he says, when he says teachers of what is good, there's several words for good, and the word here is beautiful. What's beautiful? Now, again, he's talking about what's beautiful to the Lord. So he's talking about what reflects God's attributes lived out in humanity. Teachers of the beautiful. Subjectively, of course, with the one who decides what beautiful is being the Lord. But it's all written here in his word for us. It says, they are to teach what is good. And he says... And so train the young women. This was neat, too. You know, we've talked about the word uh, that, that is translated uh, in ESV and NIV as self-control. And we've talked about the underlying meaning. Um, and what's so neat to me, I, I love languages. I, I just absolutely do. And in Greek, there's two different verbs associated with this idea of sensibility. Remember, that's uh, an inner outlook that is balanced according to God's word. So that's why I said sensible. I think that's a, a really good word. It's the NASB translation. So sensibility. There's two verbs. One is to be living sensibly. And the other one, which is here, means to pass on or to impart sensibility. Um, in, in, in Arabic and in Hebrew, I think it's in Hebrew too, but in Arabic... There's a way to put a stress on one of the syllables. It's the center syllable of a verb. And when you put a stress on that center syllable, it means to make somebody else do that action. So if I say hear, and I just say that word, it means that I want to hear. If it says, if you stress the center, center syllable, it says make somebody hear. You make that person hear. Now, it's a subtlety of language doesn't exist in English but it does here in Greek. Not exactly the same as in Arabic, but you see, by making it this particular kind of verb, he's saying, by older women, by your reverent behavior, by the fact that you're not slandering, you're not destroying brothers or sisters with your, your words, you're building people up. You're using your words to pray for somebody, to encourage somebody. You're not a slave to much wine. You're keeping sober so that you can give good advice at all times, so you can live honorably wherever you are. You're a teacher of what is beautiful by your whole life, and you're doing this so as to train sensibility in the younger women. This, this word is repeated for every group of people. This idea of being sensible. And as I was thinking about the attributes of God this week, I was, I've was i been reading um, a book by Arthur Pink called The Attributes of God. Um, he was relatively unknown in his life, but now seminary students everywhere read about this guy uh, and read his words. But one of the things that, that, and when you look at the attributes of God that are just a marvel to me, and I, I hope it's a marvel to you, is how all of God's attributes work together to where one never cancels out the other. 
And I'll give you an example. Love my kids. Love them. Want to see them grow in godliness. Want to see them uh, succeed in life generally, but I want them to follow Jesus. I want to teach them and train them according to the word. But sometimes my sense of justice overrules my kindness. Right? Where I'm too harsh in my punishment. And then I have to go back and I'm like, man, I was too harsh. I was too stern. I'm really sorry that worked out. Or sometimes my sense of kindness and my desire to be liked causes me to be less just or not punish as I should. You see? But God is not like that. His justice and his mercy and his love, all of those things are always acting in perfect concert. God is sensible. All of who he is is always acting in balance. We are called, whether you're older women or younger women or older men or younger men or whatever your profession, if you are in Christ, you are called to godly sensibility. You're called to be growing in all of these attributes of God. And, and, and Paul says very specifically to Titus, hey, listen, if you're teaching when you teach publicly and the husbands are leading their wives in this godly way and setting a godly example and the older women are acting in this way, showing godly biblical beauty that reflects the glory of God in everyday situations and in all of them, then that's going to help train the younger women. And he says specifically, so that they would love their husbands and children. And I, I included uh, working at home here uh, when I, we can go ahead and advance to the next one. Um, I included working at home here partly for the sake of time and partly to make sure we got this right. Check out Proverbs 31. Uh, you'll have to do it in your own time. We don't have time to go there today. But a godly woman is not limited to only being in her house. Right? When he says working at home, he doesn't mean you can't have a job outside of the home. He doesn't mean that. Um, but what he means is, and by, by having here first loving husbands and loving children and putting working at home with that, what he's saying is women... In general, if you are married and you have children, then your highest priority of human relationships is your husband and your children. That's your highest priority. So nothing wrong with having a job, but don't let it take away the priority that God gives you for your husband and for your children. Some, some lie happened uh, in, this, in this country a long time ago uh, that said that it was more important for your kids to have things than to have two parents. And that's come out in all sorts of ways. Young women, middle-aged women, older women, your husband and your children are your godly priority. Um, there's a reason why it seems that Christians are usually raised Christian, not that they become Christians because they're born into a family, but that they're raised to Christ through a godly family. There's a reason for that. Because mothers, you have your kids for around 18 years. That's a lot of time to pray for them, to teach them, to train them, by your whole life that they need to follow Christ. You can't guarantee the salvation of your children, but you can do all in that's prescribed in Scripture and all the best human means, earthly means, for your children by making sure that your husband and your children are your primary human responsibilities. That work comes second, hobbies come second, all those other things come second. Men don't escape, right? Our, our families are also our highest human priority. 
men, your highest human priority is your wife, and after that, your children, and after that, work and other things. That's the way that God has organized the family. This, this passage speaks so much more than just to women because it speaks to women for the benefit of the entire church because as each family is living a more godly lifestyle and each family is, has a whole growing in godliness, then those families are going to affect the other families as well. It's going to be an encouragement to each other, an exhortation, and even at sometimes a rebuke to each other. Women, make your family your priority. Now, self-controlled, we already talked about this. This is godly sensibility. In other words, your mind needs to focus on the most important truth according to God's word. You need to have a balance in your mind where the godly things and godly commands, godly attributes, where those are the most important things to you. Everybody has to live in this world and take care of earthly responsibilities, but we have to put them in their proper place. So self-controlled or sensibility is important, pure. There's no easier way to say it. It's sexual purity. That's what he's talking about. It's the same way when he told Timothy, make sure you behave in purity toward all people in the church. And he's talking about the uh, younger women. Treat them as sisters, right? He's talking about sexual purity. Kind. Again, the word is good. It is intrinsic good. Good, as God says, it's good for its own sake. It has real, intrinsic value. It's not just value like for paper money, right? The value of paper money is that we've all agreed that this will represent the best of our labor, right, and our buying power with each other. It doesn't have any real intrinsic value. Right? You bur burn a dollar and nothing's whatever. Right? It doesn't have any intrinsic value. But this good that he's talking about has intrinsic value because it's delivered over to us by God. Like in the very first chapter of the Bible, you know, God saw that this was good and this was good and this was good. It's good because God says so. Submissive to their own husbands. Now, I'm going to take it and I'm going I'm to say them quickly. And I, I wrote these down because I knew that I would fumble them if I did not. Um, I wanted to give us five notes about submission. We might not think right away. Submission is coming under the authority of. It's originally a military term, but it doesn't mean that you should run your house like a military, okay? He says, being submissive, and I guess this is a sixth note, this is the women who are called to be submissive. It's not one of those weird verbs where he says, men, make your women submit. Don't mistake that. That's not anywhere in the Bible. It's a voluntary submission. So he says women should be submissive to their own husbands. It's coming under their authority. It is not a groveling, sniveling, cringing, quiet obedience. That is not what submission is. It's not that. It is a recognition of the authority that God gave you for your own spiritual good. Um, through in your husband, that is. It's not saying that you submit because he's a perfect man or even a very good man. But you submit to him because he's the husband that God has given to you. And God causes all things to work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes, even if you think your husband has a million shortcomings. Because God sees his heart and he knows he has more. But God has given him to you. So submit to your husband's. Now, it's to the Lord, right? And so we want to make some, uh, we want to be careful about how we say this. Uh, the second, um, I'll go ahead and say this, the fourth one now. So when we say it's in the Lord, we mean that godly women are never called uh, to submit to their husbands in following them in sin. You're never called to follow your husband in sin. If there's a, a right way to put that prayerfully, carefully, respectfully to your husband, put it that way but you're never called to follow your husband in sin, ever. But it might mean that you have to follow him along in a bad decision. And the reason I said it's not a quiet submission is because men, you are absolute fools 
if you don't talk through something with your wife when you have differences of opinion about how to go. Because God has given your wife wisdom and experience. He's given her the Holy Spirit. She's an equal partner with you in Christ. Listen to the wisdom that she's given you. There is a difference between this cringing submission that people accuse the church of and the beautiful complementary relationship that God's given us, where he's given us different roles and different giftings so that when we work together, we're following Christ and we're making uh, the relationship between God and his people, that is Christ in the church, like a marriage, Ephesians 5, visible to the world through godly submission on one hand and loving sacrificial leadership on the other. Prayerfully, carefully work things out together if you have a difference of opinion, but there may be times when you're called to submit, even if you think it's a bad decision. Uh, thirdly, submission does not lower your dignity, your value, or your worth. You, women are equally created in the image of God. Equally created in the image of God. You have equal value. Remember that Jesus, and you can check out the Gospel of John again, multiple times, Jesus says, I'm obedient, I'm submissive to the Father. Holy submissive, I always do what he says. Does that lower the value of Christ? Not one iota. Not one bit. Because his name is over all the names. Philippians chapter 2. Um, fourthly, I have said this before and I'll say it again, and I'll try to remember it every time we talk about submission. Uh, no one, no, no wife is ever called to submit to abuse. Ever. Call the authorities, talk to the church. No woman is called to submit to abuse. Finally, Paul says very clearly here that women are to be submissive to their own husbands. And I want to clarify this point. Although younger women or men may look to older examples in the church and like, oh, that's a godly example. I should listen to that counsel or whatever. That's fine, right? But women here, young women, older women, they're called to submit to their own husbands. They are not called to submit to men in general. This idea that women are always to be submissive to men within the church structure is false. Women are called to be submissive to their own husbands. Men, whether leaders or not, have taken advantage of this way too many times. It is ungodly. It's wicked. And just women, I just want to let you know this. You are not called to submit to any man in the church. You're called to submit to the word of God. If you are living in sin, you may have to submit to the church's authority and discipline. And you are called to submit to your own husband, but not to all the men of the church. That's not how this works. That's not how submission works. We need to be careful about that. And he says that all of these things, right, all of these characters, character traits that he highlights, these behaviors he highlights for the older women and the, the, the younger women, this is so that the word of God would not be blasphemed. Why? Because the gospel is transformative. And if you're living the same way as a pagan, then you're not living the gospel life. And anybody can say, hey, look, you say you believe in Jesus, but you're, you're drunk three days a week. You watch all manner of garbage. You listen to all manner of garbage. You speak all manner of garbage. You treat your husband terribly. Or wife, right? It could go either way. You treat everybody in your life bad. Your, your children are the last on your priority list. And yet you tell me you've been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ha! Don't tell me that. Because what you're doing when you do that, the same thing that the Lord told the people in the Old Testament, you are causing my name to be blasphemed among the Gentiles or among the nations. So obedience is serious. That is not something to play around with. Because when you don't, you cause the word of God to be reviled. You give fuel, you give ammunition to all those people who say, 
That's just another religion. It doesn't mean anything more or less than any other philosophy that anybody's ever had or any supposed God anybody's ever come up with. So let me ask you this question. I'm going to do a comparison, and I'm going to close. What kind of woman are you? What kind of woman are you? I gave us a couple of lists right here. I didn't talk about all the characteristics, but I gave us a couple of lists. So on one side, we have what Titus 2, 1 through 10 tells us to do. Oh, that's, is that small enough? Okay, that's big enough. You guys can read that. Um, if you want a picture, take a picture. If you want to talk about it later, we'll talk about it later. But I'm going to run through this list briefly. Reverent in behavior, holy behavior, right? Whereas the world says, don't judge me. I'm going to live how I want. What do you mean judging me? They even try to get religious and talk about Matthew chapter 7 without reading the whole thing. They want to talk about logs and specks, but they don't want to talk about what Jesus says at the end of that, where he says, first deal with the log, and then help your neighbor with the speck. Or Matthew chapter 18, if you see your brother in sin, go to him privately and deal with it, right? Or 1 Corinthians, and expel the unbeliever from among you. The wicked person, the one who's engaged in sin and won't repent. Right? So the world says, don't judge me, live any way you want. The world says, live holy lives, women. And everything that you do, be reverent. Not slanderers. I'm just telling it like it is. I'm calling it like I see it. I'm going to speak my mind. Is that the way you want to live your life? I've heard that too many times from people. Hey, I don't want to hear gossip. I'm just telling it like it is. I'd tell it to their face. That's not the point. You're trying right now to destroy this brother or sister in my mind. And you're sinning against God. And you're copying the devil. It's not speaking your mind. It's not telling like it is. It's slander. And it's sin. The world says, relax, just have a good time. Have a few drinks. Cool off, relax. The Bible says, no, don't be drunk but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The world says beauty is subjective. What's beautiful to you may not be beautiful to me, and it's almost always external of the world. But the Bible says, okay, if you want to say beauty is subject subjective, it's subject to what God says about it. I want to read something to you. I know we're running a little bit over time here, but I think it's worth it. 1 Peter chapter 3. Wives, in the same way, he's talking about submission in other in earlier areas. So he says, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Peter agrees, just your own husbands. So that if any one of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and the reverence of your lives. He says, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Women, when you trusting in Jesus Christ... Look to the word, not just in the female-specific passages where it tells you what godliness looks like, but in all of what Scripture tells us, what godliness looks like lived out. As you do that, you grow in beauty, the right kind of beauty, beauty that the Lord approves of. And hopefully, even if your husband is too boneheaded to notice it, he will eventually pray for him. But you want to excel in that kind of beauty, the kind of beauty that the Lord finds beautiful, he finds attractive. That's the one whose attention you need the most anyway. And hopefully that's the one whose attention you want the most anyway. Training young women. That's old-fashioned. Just be your own person. You don't need to be trained. You can just be who you are. We're unique. Don't listen to those voices. Loving your husbands and your kids first. No, you've got to love yourself first, the world says. Don't listen to that lie. Don't listen to that lie. You love yourself enough. Probably too much. 
That's all of us again. I'm not picking on women. We all love ourselves too much. We're all thinking about ourselves too much. Love other people. Pure, chaste, and faithful. The world says pursue your pleasure. You're not happy, go somewhere else to find it. God says that's going to lead you to hell. Be pure. Submissive to your husband. No, stand on your own two feet. Be your own person. Call it like you see it. That's a consequence of the fall. That struggle, women, that you have sometimes against your husband's authority, that's the consequence that Eve was warned about in the garden. Men, the struggle you have dominating your wives and trying to force them to do what you want rather than talking them, praying them, showing them in the word, leading gently and loving sacrificially, that consequence is there too. He said you're going to seek to dominate your wives. And women, he says, you're going to seek to try to take the authority away, try to usurp that authority. You're going to try to lead your husbands instead. Both of those are wrong. So how do you do this, right? And we've, we've talked more specifically to women, but I've included the men because it's necessary. We have to. We have to look at ourselves, all of us. So, but how specifically, women, how can you be the one that Christ has called you to be? Well, I'm going to try to sum this up quickly, but it's, you know, it's important that we understand this. One, stop listening to the world. I don't care if it's a magazine. I don't care if it's a mirror. I don't care if it's your mother-in-law. Stop listening to the world. Don't look at yourself in the mirror and say, this is how beautiful or attractive I am. Look in the mirror of God's word and see what God has done so that you can grow in beauty, real beauty, beauty that won't fade. Beauty that's going to shine like the stars in heaven for all of eternity. Stop listening to the world. Social media, Facebook, TikTok, all those other things, they can't tell you how to follow Jesus. There might be some people out there putting verses up, but there's too much else to sort through. Don't listen to the world. Listen to the word. Secondly, don't live by yourself and for yourself. What I mean that is don't live by yourself or stop living by yourself thinking that you can do it all by yourself. You cannot. God has not designed us in the church to do things by ourselves. Men need the support of a godly woman in a home. Women need the support of a godly husband in the home. Women need other women in the church. Stop trying to do it by yourself. Don't try to have on Sunday morning a Facebook sort of presentation for your life. You know, where you set the lighting up, everything just right, and you get just the right picture, and everybody's got a smile on. Don't try to do that. Be real women with other sisters in the church when you need help. And the other side of that is don't live for yourself. Hey, I've raised my kids. I'm done helping people. No. We're called to be a living sacrifice. Older women in the church, and I'm, I'm not going to call you very specifically, older women in the church, and you can maybe start in like mid-30s and work your way up. And there's some crossover. You know, I'm not trying to like, here's a box. I've just graduated to older woman. Uh, and younger women, I want you to think through this, okay, for me, please. Younger women and older women, I want you to start praying specifically for the other women in the church. Now, I know some of you are already doing this. Praise God for you. I'm very, very happy. Let's keep doing it. Older women in the church, I want you to think about some of the younger women in the church. If you need to open the directory and start looking through, do that. And start praying, Lord, how can I use the wisdom and the experience and the knowledge of the word that you've given me to help these young women love their husbands and their children better? and walk with Jesus better. How can I do that? Older women in the church, I want you to take me seriously, and I want you to do that. How can I do that? And I want you to think actively about those younger women that God's already given you interactions with. 
How can I help them? Younger women, same thing to you. Think about the older women in the church. Think about those women who have years of experience. And instead of looking up on Google seven ways to be prettier or seven ways to make your husband listen or seven ways, whatever, instead of looking up those type of things, go talk to an older woman in the church. You don't have to be specific. We want to make sure things are trust there. Remember the word slander? Remember gospel? Like You need to be somebody you can trust. But you should be able to trust women in the church, right? Stop trying to do it by yourself, younger women. This is like the heart. This is the organic discipleship. An older woman saying to herself, you know what? My kids are out of the house. They've got kids of their own. I don't have to have the same kind of uh, uh, day-by-day instruction with them anymore. So I have something to offer the rest of the church, and I'm going to start thinking about the younger women. Lord, show me how I can do that. Same thing with younger women. Lord, you know, I, I want to listen to my mom, but she's not a believer. Or I want to listen to this person, but she's not a believer. I need advice, but I know it's not godly advice. Think about the older women in the church that you've talked to. If it needs to start this way, hey, just can you pray with me? That's the, my third point, you know, is prayer. Um, pray. Pray for each other. Pray for yourselves. And then act on that. Reach out. Finally, look to Christ. Because true beauty is revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And all throughout the word, we see his character. But remember this part of it, too, that Christ is in you, according to Colossians. That's part of the mystery of of, of the gospel that wasn't revealed until the New Testament fully. Christ is in us. He said, I'm always going to be with you, even to the end of the age. He's in us. Look to Christ. Don't listen to the world. Don't live by yourself for yourself. Reach out to other women in the church. Pray for other women in the church. Pray for yourselves and look to Christ. If you want to be a godly woman, a beautiful woman, a sound woman in the church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for this call that you have given us to live out the gospel. God, I know that not one of us can do it on our own, neither apart from you nor apart from the church. Father, help us, this this idea of friends following Jesus, help us to actually put that into practice more and more. As Paul said to the Philippians, help us to abound more and more in love. God, it is my prayer that any person here who is following Christ would grow more connected to this local church. Will you please work in our hearts and knit our hearts together, knit our lives together for the sake of your kingdom, for the sake of your glory, for the sake of our growth. In Jesus' name, amen.